we doing, everybody? You can hear me clap once. You can hear me clap twice. You can hear me clap three times. All right. Are any teachers in the any teachers in the audience? It's Teacher Appreciation Week. Okay. Oh, good. Yes. Okay. Happy, happy Teacher Appreciation Week. Uh, I'm Tyler King, City Councilman for District 6, uh, which of course includes uh, all of San Isidro. And we wanted to have today uh, specifically outside the loop because I know there's it's, it's a growing part of, of the community. Um, a lot of growth in District 6 is happening here. Um, a lot of excitement, but of course a lot of growing pains. So um, trying to get a better idea of what um, you all uh, experience here and um, you can introduce some ideas or, or concerns that I may not have heard um, so thank you uh, before we get started in, in, in my section we uh, I'm really grateful that um, members of uh, TechStot representatives are here uh, to give a brief uh, overview about what's happening right now uh, and in the loop uh, loop 20 uh, widening uh, US 59 uh, which is going to eventually, you know, get us all the way to Houston, right? But the big thing they're doing, the $350 million project that's uh, get, getting, just got started in February uh, for the four overpasses. So if you, I actually had someone ask me the other day, hey, what are they building there uh, along Tamiu all the way? And I'm like, well, it's, 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 not, it's not a single building. You know, they're, they're laying the utilities uh, in, in this first year for um, this $350 million project and the four overpasses preparing for that and that's going to be of course at Shiloh, Del Mar, Jackman, and University. So we're really excited about that but of course uh, a big project like that um, there's, there's going to be uh, you know things along the way that happen where our, our job is to work with them as a city to make sure um, that they have all the information they need from us uh, and that we're working side by side uh, and responding to anything that comes up together. So anyway, uh, without further ado, uh, we have Mr. Raul Leal, our PIO, uh, our TechDots PIO, and um, Jose Vargas, and you're the director of... Uh, area Engineer. Yes, the Area Engineer. And if you want to just uh, come up and I'll uh, give, give you the mic, and um, just since you guys are affected so much being outside the loop, I figured it would be nice to have uh, TechDot here uh, to kind of just give a brief explanation about what's going on. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. King. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jose Vargas. I'm the Maredo Area Engineer. Uh, our area covers uh, Everland Global, and I'm here to give, a, like Dr. King mentioned, a, a, a briefing on the construction project that is going on right now uh, here in Loop 20. Uh, designation change to US 59, and, and as uh, Dr. King said, this is to connect uh, the International Crossing and I-35 uh, to 59 going to, to Houston. Uh, so this is the okay. Is that better? Okay. So this is the largest project that we have ever had in the Laredo district. So we're very proud to to have this project. Uh, again, we have a group of people that's committed to to delivering this this project uh, here to the community. Uh, so it led uh, late last year. It started construction uh, February 19 of this year with an estimated completion date of five years. Uh, we have five phases in the project. I'll briefly explain uh, so you kind of get a picture of what we're gonna be doing. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll open it up for uh, a few questions if, if you need further clarification. So uh, the project is roughly six miles. It starts just north of the airport and it connects to the main lanes here on uh, in, by International where we constructed the last overpass, I guess like three three years ago, around around that time. So we're gonna be connecting. So in a nutshell, so you can just picture what we're doing. Uh, we're bringing the cross section or the profile of main lanes and frontage road towards the south. So we're gonna have main lanes, uh, 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 three main lanes uh, going northbound and southbound. And we're also gonna have service roads or what we call frontage roads also three lanes to provide access to all the uh, residential areas and the businesses. Um, we are gonna be doing it in three, fa uh, I'm sorry, in five phases. So right now, what you're seeing right now is uh, phase zero. Uh, can't really explain what we call it phase zero, but here we are. So we're doing uh, underground work, uh, utility work, water lines, uh, sewer lines, uh, relocation of, of utilities such as gas, uh, communication, and a lot of the underground uh, drainage that we need for the for the roadway. So that's you know you're 
pretty much seeing uh, a lot of dirt being moved, not a whole lot of things going up. That's because we are working on the drainage items and on the underground utilities. Uh, that phase is estimated to last approximately a year to a year and a half. Then we're going to move traffic to the newly constructed frontage road uh, that is going to be on the east side of the roadway. And then the existing southbound traffic is going to switch to the existing northbound uh, main lane. I don't know if it makes sense. We're going to cross them to the other side of the median. And then we're going to reconstruct the existing southbound uh, main lanes uh, for it to become the southbound frontage road. Once we complete uh, the southbound frontage road, we're going to move traffic back. Uh, that's going to take approximately a, another year. And then we're going to work in the center. I don't know if you all remember how we did the Omar McPherson. We have the traffic uh, on the frontage road. And we were working in the, in the middle portion with retaining walls, bridge work, and main lanes. So we're doing concrete pavement. Again, the need of this project is to uh, meet the demands of existing and future uh, traffic uh, based on, on all the on the growing of the region and the, the growing of the community. So that's pretty much in a nutshell how we're doing how we're building this project. Um, I can take a, a few questions, a couple of questions, clarify things. Yes, um, recently, there have been a lot of issues with the system for crossing import to Mexico. Okay. And it has been a nightmare over here on Los Blues And it's not only right here, it has been all the way up to possibly Walmart by Blues right? Yes. How is this going to be affecting that? Because I work with logistics, mm -hmm. and I see that issue happening uh, at least every month or so. I know it's not up to us, right? It's not up to you also because the system just goes down. But how is that going to be affecting that, uh, that issue? The, the sequence of construction and the traffic control plan was developed to uh, keep the existing uh, lanes as much as possible. There are going to be interference. Uh, most When we, when we close uh, lanes, we're going to uh, work at night. Uh, unless there's an emergency when we may need to be out there uh, during the day. But for the most part, the way we uh, set up the traffic control plan for this project is to maintain as much as possible the existing capacity of Loop 20. Because we, we understand this is the, the major uh, arterial here in the, in the city along with I-25 and mines. So that's, that's how we plan, uh, how that's how we sequence the, the, the traffic control plan. Yes. And just to add that, um, from the city side, we've been working with our Port of Entry Advisory Committee um, and our Laredo Police Department and uh, Port Police um, to basically come up with contingency plans for that because we know it's absolute chaos when you have 8,000 trucks all of a sudden uh, unable to get where they need to go. Um, especially that a few weeks ago, it, it happens quite regularly even if Sometimes you may notice, and you know, sometimes not, when it happens for the 10, 30 minutes, we get updated on that, and we're all just, you know, holding our breath, hoping that it's going to come back on anytime soon. But of course, when it doesn't come on right away, we have to have a contingency plan. Uh, and they came up with several ideas, and ultimately, um, you know, the furthest, because we actually, as you know, uh, a couple months ago, six weeks ago, it went all the way back. I, to Tammy U or even further, all, almost to the airport. Yeah. That was when it was pretty much the whole day. And so that will not be happening anymore because um, basically what the uh, Port of Entry Advisory and police came up with was never letting it go past international again, which I know is already too far, okay? Um, and basically turning the loop there where people have to U-turn and then go back to 35, go north towards Killam Industrial Park and then U-turn, basically to keep a constant flow and almost like in a holding pattern uh, while we're waiting for uh, the um, for the system to come back up on the Mexico side. Now, if it gets to capacity for that holding pattern, then the next uh, stage is sending out uh, communications to all associations, uh, trucking associations, um, via, there's text updates, but there's also uh, networks of WhatsApp chains, which you know, as you know, in international trade, uh, WhatsApp is a, an official form of communication. So we have direct lines with some of the uh, from some of those channels, and to ask people to hold off all trucks uh, in, in, a, in a moment.
minutes notice when, when that when that capacity is happening and but that's step two and then step three of course is finding more of like a public parking availability you know and that's about acquiring land so we are looking at those options but um, you know that that's the current plan that was actually discussed at last night's council meeting and um, it's not it's not perfect it's just a band-aid we have to have a better long-term plan uh, because considering we have such little control about what happens on the Mexico side but of course we are having those high-level conversations with uh, with the Mexican counterparts our mayor uh, our state reps uh, state senators um, congressmen as US senators that was part of our in our DC trip in March we were echoing that everywhere we could go um, and, um, and even discussing with the U.S. or uh, the Mexican ambassador to the U.S. and he agreed it was, um, you know, a, a, a serious problem. And uh, he's working with his federal counterparts in, in Mexico City. Um, but yeah, it's a it's frustrating to have to try to control another country. But we have to do our best on our side to mitigate it. But I, yeah, yeah. Any other text dot specific questions? I don't want to keep them all evening. I didn't mention uh, our. Our uh, district engineer, Epi Gonzalez, is with us as well. Um, so, um, good afternoon. Yeah, okay. Text out specific. What is the plan for the loop in front of our neighborhood, like the Crepe School of Are they going to widen that, you know? Oh, you mean s specifically about the text out widening? Right, yeah. It doesn't go all the way. Yeah. So, uh, like I mentioned, we're going to bring the existing cross section that we have uh, here in International. We're gonna move it to the south, so uh, there's gonna be an area that is gonna be occupied by the new Adquire right away. It's not gonna go all the way to the to the fence line, uh, but yeah, it's gonna be widened to accommodate the main lanes. So if you can picture the area in international, we're gonna pretty much continue that uh, towards the south, uh, all the way to the airport, just north of the airport. Continue. I'm sorry, I didn't get the, the last. Is one. it going to continue? The, is the winding how far? Is it going to go like uh, north of Shiloh? Yes, it's going all the way uh, just south of Jackman. So we're building four overpasses: uh, Jackman, International, Delmar, and Shiloh. No. But like right across from our neighborhood here, though, is, is it going to widen towards the neighborhood? Though? Yes. Okay. Yes, a little bit towards the east. Yes, sir. Okay. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So that highway is going to be a complete highway without any stops? Uh, without that, any stops? That's correct. Yeah, because there's been a lot of accidents on the roads. Anything that's going to alleviate that? Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and one major uh, uh, consequence of this project is improvement of safety. Okay. So, yeah, the, the main uh, traffic is going to be going nonstop pretty much all the way from the international crossing uh, towards the, the airport. Okay. And then uh, all the neighborhoods and, and the businesses are going to be in the front of this road when it's low speed. Uh, we're going to have traffic signals running those intersections, but since we don't have the main traffic anymore, it's going to run a lot uh, efficient. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I guess I'm sorry. I have just one more question uh -huh. for you. Is there any way to move, I mean, I know that this bridge was built for the trucks to come and go. Is there any way to move them to Columbia? Because, I mean, there's a lot of residential area here, and I'm afraid of a fatality because, I mean, there's a lot of, this, uh, this is a community that a lot of people here, kids, and, I mean, to me, that's dangerous. Yeah, I think, you, you mean specifically when the, the Mexican system goes down and I, how to manage that? I would say, yeah. I guess, I mean, yeah. that's the only time it really yeah. affects, but if mm -hmm. they can completely just move it over there because it's yeah. constantly shutting down, yeah. I mean, that's yeah, what I thought. Of course, uh, you know, we're proud that we're the number one uh, port in the country, but we also know that um, for those of us who don't work in international trade and are just trying to, you know, live our lives, like, this, this is not always, uh, you know, it's... Like I, tr I try to explain to some of the international, you know, community who are so excited about the fact that we are number one, and I'm, I'm like, you know, most of Laredo is not that happy about that. <laughs> most of Laredo uh, who are not in trade, they don't get as excited as everybody else who's in trade does, right? Um, and especially our friends who live in the Mines Road area, they've been living in, in a hellacious situation for decades, right? Yeah. 
Um, and now, because of the situations happening now, we in District 6 are seeing what they've been seeing for a while. And um, so when you, when you, when I, when well, I we used to live in yes, yes. So you, you moved away from there to avoid it. Yes, avoid it, and we're yes. having to make yes. the same problems here. Understood. 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 Yeah. <laughs> now I, I think long term uh, we'll definitely uh, you know not going to be a, a mind road uh, 2.0 in the long term. You know, as as you mentioned with Colombia, um, that uh, that bridge is finally starting to pick up. It was we've had decades of that bridge being underperforming. Finally, because of the nearshoring happening in Mexico, so we and for those that aren't aware, a lot of um, nearshoring is happening from China, right? Uh, we're manufacturing both American, Chinese, and other international uh, manufacturing is moving or adding its uh, manufacturing in Mexico, um, and essentially, uh, 80 percent, 70 to 80 percent of all the nearshoring going to Mexico is going to Nuevo León. Uh, you know, around Monterrey. And so, where does all the trade from uh, Monterrey and Nuevo León go? You know, it goes right through Laredo for the most part, a big chunk of that. Um, so we're, we're gonna be bearing a lot of that. But there are big texta in, in city and state plans. Uh, for example, Viaseo Road, which will connect Mines Road to 35. Uh, and then Hachar Ruthinger, which will ch collect, which is collecting Colombia to 35. As you, if you drive out that area, you see all the warehouses going up in that area. But that doesn't mean the current stuff in Mines Road is going away either, right? So, we, you know, there's still, um, you know, Vanessa, Vanessa, Perez, uh, Vanessa Perez, the council member for District 7, uh, is advocating for the River Road project um, to allow another outlet for the Mines Road people um, west, uh, west, north, and then east, right? Um, so. You know, she's been fighting that fight her four years on council, and um, you know, and we're, we, I had this again addressed last night. So, um, I do feel that once this uh, overpass project is over, that's going to um, alleviate a lot of our problems. But of course, um, we also, like I mentioned with the step three issue earlier, we got to have a, um, you know, a, I think we need a public, massive public parking lot for when this situation happens where we can't control. Uh, the Mexican side, and we can't. We have to, um, and so that's that's kind of our next task is is finding, um, you know, a massive place because that holding pattern I was referring to earlier, um, you know, could maybe get 500 trucks, and that can quickly uh, accumulate to capacity, you know, within just a couple hours. So, uh, so. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Any other text out specific questions? Just uh, so we don't, um, you know, keep them too long. Oh, I'm yeah. not sure if it's text out, but okay. um, so I, there are some instances where right here, right after Whataburger before, those trucks that are coming out, it's, I'm driving, and because they want to get on the highway, they take forever just to get on the highway, and there's been some instances where I'm driving, and then I can't go to the left because they want to get on that highway. Is there any way they can just, but don't get on the ramp getting out of that area? Like for the, the trucks that are right there, like just to keep on going on the frontage road, how you said, you know, the slower traffic, because it's been a lot of accidents, I mean, times that they've been trying to get on, and, and there's cars, and we have to be like breaking, because they're just taking forever to try to get on that ramp. Which intersection did you say it's, again? It's right here, right before mm -hmm. um, where the movies are. Mm -hmm. Those trucks that are trying to get on, they take a while, but then after a while, they just want to get on the ramp, and cars have to stop, you know, because they want to get on the ramp. So is there a way, like, don't get on the ramp from this area? Yeah, just to we, keep we on can on the take frontage? a look at, uh, at that uh, situation uh, and see if there's uh, room for improvement there. Uh, I, can, uh, I, I can talk to the traffic engineer and, and look at that area. We don't have um, uh, hot spots in that area, but it's definitely something that we can start monitoring to, to see if there's an option there uh, to maybe channelize them to go north. Uh, yeah, we, and we they can, get on the yeah. Another hot spot is right before, uh, on the other end, uh, going into Walmart, through the underpass. People want to merge in. And oh, yeah. That yeah. There's been a lot of near misses there. Like yeah. Every day. Uh, that, that one, as uh, soon as we complete the project, that one is going to open up to a uh, three lane front dish road. Yeah, so so they yeah. the same thing. And the trucks, they do the turn around, they want to get one, to over there. And the Walmart one. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that that situation there on the where, where traffic is merging, that's gonna be resolved with, uh, oh, no, with no, this project. I'm not talking about passing Walmart. It's before what people are trying to go into Walmart between okay. Panda and Walmart. Okay. 
Yeah, there's already a, a, a auxiliary lane there. Uh, again, we can we can take a look at it. And we don't need to. Yeah. We do we do a lot of coordination also with uh, PD if it's an enforcement issue. I'm pretty sure we can reach out. Uh, but yeah, there's already a, an auxiliary lane there for the public to get off the, the frontage road and then access. So that, that's something that we can a lot of people are doing that they stop on, 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 the, on the return, mm -hmm. when you do the U-turn, yeah. uh -huh. and they stop there and try to go so across. To try to cross. And then people coming okay. in, well, they're going to just run people over. Yeah. OK. And regarding the Waterburger situation, I'm sorry. Regarding the Waterburger situation, I've noticed this. And I don't know if it only happens to me, right? But when I go to Waterburger, and I want to get back over here. I have to go around, right? Yeah. Is there a way to make a path so it actually connects to Academy, so or closer to Academy? So instead of us having to go get in the loop, get into the truck area, and go around, we just go behind. Uh, that information I, I don't have it, uh, but I know the city has uh, uh, a plan, uh, I guess, to, to accommodate the growth. Uh, that that's outside of the right away where I'm, I'm, I don't know if that can be followed by the okay. city staff. Yeah. And one more question for for Textbot is regarding traffic and the noise from the loop, right? So I've noticed that I don't know if it happens in the middle of the night. There's a lot of drag racing happening around in the loop 20, and the noise is really really loud, right? First question is how can that be taken care of? And the second question is, how is the, how is the construction of this multi-million dollar project going to be affecting the noise level? Because from what I'm understanding is you guys are actually going to build something closer to our community. So that's going to increase the noise, isn't it? Uh, we, we, we have provisions in the, in the plans to, to minimize that. Uh, as part of the planning of the project, there was an environmental assessment where you know they analyzed the, the noise levels that it was going to be produced. Mm -hmm. uh, as part of the project, we are it's called tiny. We are grinding uh, the concrete pavement in a way to also minimize the noise. So the idea is to get it as close as the smoothness that we get with uh, asphalt, and of course getting the durability of the concrete. So those are, those are some of the uh, items that we have in the contract to to minimize uh, the noise, or at least keep it close to the same levels. Yeah, so th that's, that's what we have to in the, in the place. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Jesus Torres. Uh, the only concern I have is that turning lane to the right on Havana Street from the loop southbound. Is it gonna be wide enough, or is it gonna be fixed in the way that you can actually make a, a functional turning lane without the fear that somebody's going to rewrite it. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, once this project uh, is complete, that's going to be tying into the frontage road, which will be at a lower speed as the main lanes. So for starters, uh, all the main lane traffic, the, all the traffic that it wants to go south, are not going to be sharing the same road with the people that is trying to access the, the neighborhood. So the speed is going to be lower. We're going to have three lanes, potentially less traffic. And of course, with all the design criteria to make that turn uh, to, to the neighborhood. Uh, that is on the third phase, so probably starting uh, two, two, no, two, 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 two years, one and a half years. Yeah. Yeah. To be clear, the current loop on that southbound lane, that would be frontage road yes. in this final. Yeah. Yes. Can you, uh, really quickly, can you, are there designated? They are designed to service the intersections. So uh, coming from the south will be uh, entrance and exit uh, ramps at uh, uh, Jackaman, uh, University, Delmar, and Shiloh. So uh, you can picture it's going to pretty much look very similar to what we have in the uh, uh, international McPherson area. Did, did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah. I have that information. Yes. 
uh, we're working on a website. It, it's already live. Uh, uh, we're gonna set up uh, uh, updates there on, on traffic and, uh, switches patterns. We're also coordinating with the city of Laredo through our PIO. So we're gonna be notifying uh, so uh, we can distribute notifications uh, weeks in advance when we have a major traffic switch. And again, there's gonna be a lot of resources there like uh, schematics. Uh, you can see uh, where the, the exits and entrances are gonna be and pretty much how the ultimate project is gonna look like. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll share that with... Uh, I, I would like to share some feedback. I have seen some of those pictures before the project even starts and it's difficult to understand. <laughs> Honestly, it is because of a different point of perspective from everybody. And I'm not sure if something can be done so it's easily understandable by any person. Mm -hmm. Because honestly, when I saw that picture, and that was when I was living over there by Green Ranch, I also moved from Green Ranch over here because mm -hmm. of the same situation, you know, getting stuck in traffic for two or three hours just to get out from Green Ranch. Anyways, I saw those pictures. They actually came out on social media by Vanessa Perez, our council member. And I had more questions instead of answers when I saw those pictures. So just feedback, right, on that, that um, if we can work on making those schematics, those pictures a little bit more digestible for the whole audience, mm -hmm. and maybe put in frequently asked questions as well. Yeah. Because uh, I did have a lot of questions, and when I saw this construction, I, I had a lot of questions too regarding the, the construction as well. Though. We're gonna have that section, and the district is also working uh, on 3D uh, modeling uh, right now with all the technology that is out there uh, for for projects you know that have a lot of uh, public involvement. Uh, right now we are superimposing uh, 3D models into Google Earth to kind of give a better perspective on the ultimate, uh, I guess, uh, visualization of the project. So we're already working on some of those uh, projects to, to give a better customer service right to our constituents. So yeah, that's something that uh, we're already doing. Sir. Thank you. I think there might be something I'm interested in as well, knowing about what TxDOT's doing. Um, the International and Woodridge uh, intersection, I know most, if you live outside the loop, that's not necessarily your backyard, but you probably just south of Walmart on International. There is a plan that TxDOT has, to, to my understanding, uh, of, of, of installing a, uh, a, a light there. Um, is that something you're familiar with? Or yes. Yeah. Could you, do you think, is everyone familiar with what I'm referring to? Right in front of John Balls Park, um, International going south from the loop, um, right? Uh, it's where I have a lot of accidents and there's a lot of speeding uh, coming from the loop. Uh, and TxDOT, I believe, through a grant, uh, you're, you guys are installing a a light there. Anything I missed about that? Just, no, just okay. uh, that project uh, it's already ongoing in coordination also, also with the city of Laredo. Uh, the contractor is going to be there by the end of May, early June uh, to complete that project and of course it's going to be a, a complete traffic signal with pedestrian access as well to accommodate the, the crossing there to the park. Where, where exactly is that? It's uh, International in Woodridge which is right next to where John Balls Park is. Um, um, yeah, so when you're coming from the loop going south, uh, past Walmart, keep going south as you're going towards San Isidro, the roundabout. Uh, they'll, so there'll be a full, uh, I've gotten, the, for the people that live around there, I get a lot of complaints about that, but if, for those of you who live out here, you, you do probably still go that area, and just to be aware that they have text dot, that's a text dot project partnering with the city, so. I just wanted to add to the, the complaint about the noise. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the state is looking into perhaps installing barriers along the loop, right, for, to prevent the noise as well, a separate gravel situation. Because in essence, like, it's needs to consider to prevent a nuisance also to be present at once. Yeah, the, the results of the environmental assessment will have locations for, for noise walls. Uh, we are building uh, uh, noise walls in, in the project, uh, the locations where uh, the, the assessment warrant those walls not through the entire corridor. Yeah. Sir, I have a question. Yes. Um, are you guys going to like put like the brighter lights on the roof and also like maybe like larger like speed limits, like cautioning people to slow down? Because this area, once you come from San Diego and you come all the way to this area down to Cocosco, we're like blacked out. Then, then the light turns on like when you get to strike. So all this strip is it blacked out like at night, like really dark. So when you're getting out, like it's pretty much like black. So there's a person traveling. 
you won't see them because we don't have enough light in our area. Yeah. Like we need like lights that are like bright enough to like where you see a car that's coming the other way. What well, we're installing a uh, high mast uh, again, pretty much bringing what we currently have uh, in uh, International and McPherson. So those are LEDs, uh, high poles with several heads there. That's what we're installing uh, across the project. And what about like speed limits that are lighted as well? That are like, at least like blinking or I don't know, like large like speed limits. Because here this area is like a drag race. And it's like, yeah. like pretty yeah. much everything. Yeah. We have installed uh, some uh, radars here uh, across the, the neighborhood. Um, I guess in coordination with, with traffic and with uh, city traffic, we can we can see if after the project there are areas where we need to upgrade the signs uh, to the LEDs. But uh, for now, they are retro uh, they have retroflectivity. So as you know, the the headlights hit the sign, they should reflect. So we can look at that. Uh, I guess in coordination with the city, there are areas of concern after the project. Um, who can I contact for? Oh, I a spin bumps in your neighborhood? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah I, can I just wanna just so I can like later contact. Yeah. Um. I mean, first of all, you, there's three one one's always an option, but I'm here. Uh, I give out my cell phone pretty regularly. Uh, I prefer text first, so I can save your number. Uh, you know, get a lot of spam calls. Uh, it's nine five six three zero eight six four four zero. Don't worry, I'll, I'll give it out again if you forgot to write it down. Um, and um, you know, requesting that way. Also, yeah, she's got my, I think my card there. Um, district six at ci dot text. Okay, it's a very, it's all. Yeah. I'll give you, I'll give everyone my card. But district six at ci dot laredo dot tx dot us, just to be accurate. Um, and then we'll give you Esmeralda Estrada, uh, our council assistant for district six and eight. She'll be passing out her cards as well. You can, we'll email her. Um, and basically, there's two ways to request speed speed bumps in your neighborhood. One way is through 311 through the city. One way is through me. Um, and then I request it through traffic. They have an algorithm they go through and they study it um, and basically decide um, based off strength length, width. They, they actually get people out, the, the monitor out there to track the speeding for uh, several days, um, perform data and get data, uh, and then they ultimately give uh, a recommendation on the speed speed bumps. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Any other text dot specific questions? Yes. Does that go for um, international as well? Because um, there's so much drag racing mm -hmm. on international, starting from the United. What is it? Middle school. Mm -hmm. We've only been here a year, so I got video where kids are drag racing something that. It takes it all the way through. Yes. Yeah, to the past the four-way stop. And and this is the this is something that um, as far as international goes as a major thoroughfare, you know, um, we won't be able to do speed bumps or tables on 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 major thoroughfares. We can do neighborhood collectors, and we can obviously do uh, residential. Um, but when it when it comes to the street racing, and that was one of the items I was going to be bringing up. Uh, that is an issue we've been working really hard hand in hand with our, our, our police in the back. And as you know, the police, uh, our LPD cannot be everywhere all the time. But um, we know where the hot spots are. One of them being right out here, uh, Juan Escutia, for example, big time hot spot. We have uh, limited cameras that we have to rotate. And of course, when the cameras are there, they're, they're not there. These street racers are smart. Uh, they know where to go. They find the, the vulnerable spots, and then that's where they attack. I live uh, in Antlers Crossing, and today I got videos from people, uh, you know, s doing donuts on Springfield because it's kind of like here, still not fully developed, right? So they go to the places with the least traffic volume, but eventually they're not going to be able to hide here because, and, and obviously here there's way more houses than there, but they try to find the places that they can, they feel like they can get away with it, and of course, a lot of times they do. Um, and, and I know our chief, uh, our chief Rodriguez is on his way uh, from his son's award ceremony, and we have our uh, uh, two police officers, of course, in the back. Who um, it, I don't want to put them on the spot. I mean, I, I've, uh, text out's already taken a, a lot of the heat for me today, so I don't want to just be passing around the mic. I, I can take some heat, you know. Um, but um, but anyway. Um, this is something, you know, we have, I have several constituents who, in San Isidro who have my 
cell and I get calls at Friday at midnight, 1 a.m. Uh, I, I, in the fall, I, I, I went out and uh, went out and saw for myself. And you know, we're the key is to try your best to get um, name plate, uh, license plate numbers. That's that's really helpful. The videos help. Um, I, I'm constantly, whenever a constituent will send me that, I, I forward it to our police just, and if there can be any identifiable information, um, you know, they definitely look into it. But, you know, the state of Texas, this is something the state of Texas is seeing. This is not a Laredo issue. This is not a South Texas issue. This is a state of Texas issue. Just in the fall, Governor Abbott signed a state law that now allows uh, our uh, all local police across the state to uh, confiscate cars. Um, uh, for this, so this is something that, unfortunately, it's a culture of, of street racing that's growing. Uh, thank you, Fast and the Furious, uh, you know, for getting that started. Um, and, uh, and and it's a strong culture. They have strong networks of communication, and they talk back and forth on how they can find the the places that we're not at. Obviously, police can't be everywhere all the time. Cameras can't be every, every single corner. Um, but we need we need your help. Um, but we know roughly where the hotspots are. If you have a different hotspot, you know, our, our police are, are there. It's just, they're all, we're also having a lot of issues in South Laredo. For those of you who have friends and family in South Laredo, um, you know, rising and uh, shootings down there. And that's, uh, resources are really getting, to, uh, you know, they are getting moved down there for some of the really serious violence that's occurring in South Laredo. So, uh, but that's not to make excuses. We all, we, we live in District 6. We live in North Laredo. We want, there's a, quality of life everybody's looking for. Um, so um, have, I'm going to give you my number, but yeah, anything else? Mm -hmm. So with that said, mm -hmm. um, after school, the traffic gets really bad, um, mm -hmm. of course, on International, and it's understood. Mm -hmm. But the, the high school kids are taking a shortcut, and they go through La Paz. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid some child is going to get run over one of these days. They go so fast. Would you consider putting speed bumps in that area? Yeah, let's let's have like I said, let's have traffic uh, do the data, do the study, you know, prove you know what you've already probably seen with your eyes, um, and um, and the thing with the high school kids, I used to be a high school history teacher, so I'm not picking on high school students if there's any uh, you know high school students here, um, but um, we're having that issue across the Alexander United, even United South, other places where not only is this the speeding through neighborhoods, but the parking in neighborhoods, right? Um, because they don't have a driver's license or they don't have um, insurance, so they're not allowed to park in the school. So what do they do? They drive essentially without a license, without insurance, and they park uh, in our neighborhoods um, to walk to school. Um, and that's that's another thing that's really hard uh, to monitor because you can't just stop someone if they're not doing anything wrong. Police can't just pull over anyone that you know. There's laws against that, right? So they have to be careful about profiling. Um, our, 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 our high school kids. Um, but ultimately, yes, let's do the speed study um, for that area. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other dot specific questions before they go? Yeah. Do you have a mic? Okay. Is there a plan in place to minimize the pollution uh, pre and post construction? Yes. Yes. Uh, as part of the environmental assessment that we do, there's a lot of uh, best practices that we need to follow, like sedimentation control. There's a lot of uh, items in the contract where we need to take care of uh, not contaminating the water, uh, minimizing dust. So all of that is part of, of the contract and is closely uh, monitored by uh, DECQ. So as we want to make sure that as we develop uh, whatever project, whether it be private or, or, or public, uh, that we take the, the environment in, into account. So there's a lot of provisions in the contract uh, to not contaminate, uh, I guess, what we are building. So there's a pretty much a, a bunch of uh, sheets in the plans that we need to follow to make sure that we comply with, with environmental assessment that was made at the beginning of the project. What about picking up after you're done con uh, constructing the highway? Because I've been noticing uh, whenever you're constructing, you uh, leave a lot of construction Debris. pieces. Uh -huh. Yeah, th that's uh, at the end of the project, we do a, a final inspection. 
and the contractor is responsible for housekeeping and, and cleaning the right of way. So uh, yeah, I have also noticed uh, areas where we have debris of uh, items that were removed. So yeah, we are in constant communication with the contractor as they build uh, whatever we're doing. Uh, they need to be removing those items from the right of way. So that's something that needs to be addressed uh, at the end of each project. I would just like to add, you know, there's there's other contractors that uh, that do work on a right of way. So not all the uh, work is done by by textile contractors. Utility contractors they they sometimes yeah. leave some of those things behind, and it's kind of hard for us to to uh, to monitor some of those things. But but yeah, uh, as far as our contractors. You know, they, you know, at the end of the project, they basically do a final punch list and inspection and yeah. all that debris needs to be, you know, collected and, you know, taken to the landfill or wherever they, it needs to go. But, but uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, people people also just uh, sometimes, you know, they see a, uh, an area where, you know, they, there's debris and then, you know, before you know it, people start, you know, throwing, you know, tires or things like that and it obviously becomes a, a health uh, So there's basically contractors for everything, right? So TxDOT, like TxDOT employees are not the ones, uh, you know, necessarily doing the work. They, they, the, uh, a contractor has been bid at the project, but that doesn't mean we wash our hands. Like it's of, of the issue. We have to hold our contractors accountable. The city has to hold our, our contract. So both sides of us have to hold. You know, the mentioning there is we have other ut other types of city contractors doing work along the way. So anytime you see something like that, um, you know, you let us know and. Um, the idea is that we, you know, express our displeasure with our contractors if, if that's some, if they're not holding up their end of the deal, and finding ways to hold them accountable, you know, for for, for doing a, a clean job, right? Um, so I think his point is just there might be a there might be a textile contractor, it might be a city department's contractor, um, and then we just have to hold them accountable. So, yeah. Any other textile? We had uh, a few visitors in the late evenings. Um, is there any kind of fencing, or once they do, you know, the contracting around where they're going to be building, is there any kind of fencing for like the wild, I don't know, wild hogs, wild pigs, I don't know what they are, um, that come around and they just totally mess up your yard, they, you know, they dig everything up. Is there anything? Right. And this is a question related to the new construction that's happening right now. Um, for or you just is a general javelina. Well, I mean, the, yeah. with that and in general, because obviously yeah. we're taking their territory. Of course. So, yeah. You know, I don't know if there's anything directly being done about this is the area we're going to build. Do they fence to kind of keep these creatures out of the area? Yeah, so developers, um, well, does TxDOT do any fencing as far as uh, wild? Uh, no, I guess mm -hmm. the presence of wild animals it is due to the, I guess, uh, sources of water. Uh, pretty much when, when uh, properties acquire, existing fences are just pushed back, uh, and that's part of, uh, I guess, the, the acquisition of right away where the property owner mm -hmm. is compensated for moving their fence. Uh, but pretty much the, the animals. If they are there, is because uh, they're native to that area. There's a, a, a source of water or, or food. Uh, but uh, again, it's. Uh, yeah, I'm new to the area, so yeah. we <laughs> had some damage done to our lawn and our trees. So I'm not sure if, like, when you actually get the properties where you're going to reap or build or whatever you're doing, um, is there like. Do they put a perimeter around it, or do they don't? I, I'm not sure. No, existing fences are just pushed back, and, and again, the, the, if there are animals already there, uh, it's you know maybe because of a source of food or water. So it's not for sure. We're on our own. Cool. Yeah. And I, I want to bring our animal uh, animal uh, manager. Um, so anytime, uh, so this is obviously something. As you mentioned, we're displacing them. We got to find a better way to contain. They they. They rep they replicate in a in an extremely rapid manner. Um, the cage we, we do offer cages uh, um, for anyone who wants to call. Uh, if you're noticing it, because they move around, right? They 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 move around throughout the district. 
Yeah. And yeah, there's javelinas and then there's the wild hogs, which of course the wild hogs are the big, they're mega big ones. So maybe that was one of those. They're a lot smarter and they're a lot, it's a lot harder to catch the hogs with the cages. But the javelinas we can generally catch pretty well. Um, I just wanted to um, introduce, yeah, Mr. Gonzalez. Hello, you, you want to explain? My name the, is Fernando uh, Gonzalez, Animal Control. Uh, yes, uh, we understand the problematic uh, that we are having here because of the growth of the city. Uh, I just want to offer uh, traps. That's the only thing we can do. So we can relocate the animals. Uh, we can uh, offer that. You can give me your address. Uh, I have an officer here, so he can take your uh, address so we can uh, set up a trap in your house and relocate the animals. This is not like the real solution, but it will help right. at the end of the day. Yeah. Thank you. And you all have stayed so long. Uh, thank you so much. No, no, thank, thank, thank you, you very much. Give text up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, now we're opening it up to just anything. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, pot, potholes, uh, street paving has been... Um, it's been my probably my biggest um, priority. So we had a big chunk. Of, you know, I, I had a decent amount of um, district priority funds through our budget process last year, which is that's money that's bonded money that the city bonds out for that we can use for brick and mortar. Um, that's streets, projects, and um, and I, I I can say I've put three hundred and fifty thousand of extra dollars just towards street paving. Um, and as you might have seen, um, this city, if you close your eyes and put your finger on a map of the city, the street that your finger falls on probably needs to be paved. Now there's a few reasons for that. Um, one of them is in the 2010s, there was about six years. Um, I, we're saying 2010s now, right? Is that a thing? Okay, okay. Uh, in the 2010s, uh, there were about six years when the city was not putting money towards paving whatsoever, um, new paving program. So we're playing a little catch up there. But besides that, okay, we're not just, when, especially in this part of town, um, and this is something I've been educated by Ms. Orfila from Public Works and the engineering department, the type of clay that exists on the north side of Laredo has a really high plasticity index, PI, right? Um, anything over a PI of 30 is considered fat clay and the PI of the clay around here, some of it is in the 40s, 50s, sometimes even in the 70s. So, so what happens <laughs> is that means the water cannot permeate um, through that clay. That's impermeable clay. So it's a really big challenge. I'm just giving you kind of the where I've had to because I've you know had to you know understand this better, right? And what is and that's actually why we have this little. Um, map here. Um, I'll just bring it so maybe more. Oh, is it is it taped? Oh, okay, never mind. Okay. Oh, it's got Velcro? Okay. Oh, nice. Okay. I feel more people can see it here. Um, so, I was waiting for this question, right? No. Okay. <laughs> no, and I, I didn't actually know Mr. Orfila was going to come up with this map, so thank you, Mr. Orfila. Where are you, Mr. Orfila? Oh, yeah. There he is. Thank you. I texted him today. I was just like, hey, you know, maybe you could talk about our French trains and the projects you're doing. I don't know if you want to come up here and play show and tell with me, sir. Um, but long story short is what's had to happen is in retrospect, because, and I've asked, you know, developers about this, you know, what if we require developers to put the French trains in the, sh in, in the streets in advance? And there was a discussion about that in the past. From what I've heard, is it's because this area is so hilly, it's difficult to know exactly where to put the French drains in advance because you almost, you, it's hard to estimate exactly where the water's going to go. Um, and so, what Mr. Afila has been doing uh, in, in the aftermath uh, of, of some of the worst of the worst, there's still lots more to be done, um, is installing French drains um, to, you know, because if, if, you, if you live, in an area with a low uh, low level of gravity, your your house is going to have a lot of uh, standing water. Now, I think we can all do a better job of 
irrigating less. Uh, we have we have to get better about water conservation. I'm not going to blame everything on irrigation though. Um, you know, in San Antonio, they only allow water irrigation once a week, and you get fined two hundred dollars if you violate that. You're only allowed to irrigate on w the day based off the number of your house. If it's a one or a two or a three or a four, that's your day to irrigate. And if you are found doing it without, you get a two hundred dollar fine. Um, and so I'm not saying we're headed there quite yet, but we, you know, with our water conservation efforts, you know, right now the Amistad Dam is at 28 percent, and we get all our water from that dam uh, upstream, right? Last year, this time, it was at 36 percent. Okay, so um, you know we're in stage two conservation right now, which currently allows three times of watering, irrigation watering per week. There's a proposal that we're submitting to the state to, that would put us at twice a week instead of three times a week. Um, but nonetheless, your question about paving, I'm gonna, I promise I'm getting to that. Um, and uh, Mr. Field, do you wanna explain what you've done with French drains? And then um, I'm, I'm gonna get to, I promise I'm not avoiding the paving question because that's, as Mr. Fila knows. Good afternoon, here. everyone. I'm John Rafida uh, from the Public Works Department. So again, the French drains or the type of soils that you all have here, the water, the irrigation systems. People say it's so people call it the water table. I'm sure, you all have heard that. It's the water table that's high. You can go to any part of these new subdivisions that are being developed when they're doing the trenches for the utilities. They're dry. There is no water. All this is irrigation, and no one's to blame. I mean, everybody likes their green grass. The water flows downhill, and eventually, some house is going to get it the worst, or some of the streets are going to get it the worst. You've seen uh, a lot of parts of this neighborhood, which engineering was made with this map here, of where we've done French drains. A French drain is a perforated pipe that goes on both sides of the street, 34 inches below, and it goes, it's supposed to travel somewhere on the Great Inlet, a detention pond, somewhere where the water can, can go and keep our street dry. Curb, I don't care what happens behind the curb. What I care is about the street to be dry between both curbs. So those of you who live in those areas, I, I have one crew that that's all they do year round. Right now they're currently on Kirby. And they're coming back to this area here. Uh, we've covered a lot of the worst areas. But you all see where the sidewalks are bleeding and the asphalt is cracking. And uh, I mean, the streets are built to city specs. But unfortunately, the clay type, the soil type, is just very high. And it's going to continue to happen until we install those French drains. Um, is there any questions? So potholes, they will. There's a difference between a pothole and where the street is cracking. Wherever the streets are cracking, uh, at intersection, we have put valley gutters, concrete valley gutters, water can flow on concrete. Uh, other areas won't get when there are potholes. So it's a call. But a lot of what I've been noticing here is the, mostly it's the street cracking. So I do have a question regarding uh, pothole reporting. Uh -huh. um, is there a better way to report potholes? The reason why I'm asking is because I reported a pothole at the beginning of the year and they just fixed it like a bunch of uh, It was really concerning because I saw a lot of cars and a lot of trucks avoiding those potholes, and I saw many near misses. Uh, I'm not sure. Where was uh, it? It's a, there were some over here close by. Was but a private neighborhood? Were, maybe? No, no, no. There was always uh, by mile 13. Uh, mile 13. Oh, industrial parks. Yeah. So that's a total different one. But yes, we also do those. We, we work industrial parks on Saturdays. We can't do them during the week. We'll get one of our guys will get run over. So Saturdays we have three crews that go out and we're hitting all the industrial parts in 10 hours. Are your guys following the protocol of Mr. refilling the trenches you are making? Because after you all are done, you get a big old crater like an Alena drive. It is horrible. Instead of being horrible, I don't think your guys are putting all the layers that are needed whenever they do the streets. I don't think they're following that at all. They're supposed to go back again. It's going to settle. You got to remember that we did a trench. And you know, you know, they look up for anything go up and down like that? Yes. And I think they're using that. Well, remember that when we dig it out, there's mud. Right. 
everything is collapsing under the curve. We got to backfill all that with time. It's going to set, and that's exactly what I want it to do. So you're going to go back and redo it? We're going to come back and redo it again. It's going to sell. Okay. And once you put the first train, your street's going to crack even more. It's going to crack, and that's when I know it's ready for research. If it hasn't cracked, it ain't ready. So now it's you're just sending it in with dirt and just... No, and not dirt. Go under and they come back with that part. And kind of, okay, so to finally answer the question about paving is, that, that's basically that part of it. We don't want to pave until it's ready, and because then you don't want to have to come back again in a year and pave it again. So it's it's not, the, the overall, I and this is something I'm looking at and finding a way of uh, looking at an ordinance change on, um, you know, in a way that we can work with city, but also with, the builders and developers to find a happy medium on a way that we don't have to be coming back so soon to be putting in French drains. And in the past, there were discussions about requiring, um, you know, requiring developers, builders uh, to to put in the French drains. This was maybe what in the 10, 10 years ago. About twelve years ago. Okay, um, and I'm not sure if it's exactly that hard requirement in every situation, but I think we need to bring back the conversation. Um, especially on this side of town, and maybe we need to base it off PI index, and you know, uh, not every single home in, in all of Laredo, because we know that's the adding cost to the builder adds cost to the buyer, right? Um, so it's not just about being nice to the builder and developer, right? Um, so it's it's about finding that balance. So and that's in my to do list right now is to find a, I'll ask legal and and our, and our professionals to find us a, a happy proposal that. You know, everyone can agree is a, a common sense solution. So, but um, we're definitely going to be hitting. And Crepusculo, for example, uh, is going to get paved. Um, we're actually working with. Uh, so I know most of you probably don't live in Harmony Hills because it's a very new facility, uh, new development. But um, they're adding a you know utility line along Crepusculo, and that's going to require a lot of uh, street work. So we're basically going to have them do that. It's going to make a big mess. But then afterwards, they're going to give us the money uh, to to basically pave all of Corpuscula. Uh, yeah, Loop Loop Twenty will uh, go on um, Corpuscula. Will go from Loop Twenty and will connect to the southern part of Harmony Hills. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Harmony Hills is if you're on uh, Simon Bolivar and you go all the way to the east, that's uh, their development. That's only phase one of twelve. Okay, by the way, so that's about to be a huge 600 acre. 2,200 home development, um, which will eventually connect to the coves at Winfield, uh, right outside of Shiloh. That's another 3,000 homes there. Um, so basically, outside the loop is on its way to getting interconnected with the rest of Laredo, with these overpasses, with these new developments, with these new streets being added. Um, you know, so just for those of you who lived here a while, you're, you know, it's probably felt like an eternity. Um, but um, we are getting closer to the out, outer loop folks feeling like they're part of the city. Um, so, yeah. There should be one. Here's my card, just in case I'm not understanding exactly what you're talking about. But yes, um, let me know. But I would Traffic imagine so. Traffic department here. They're taking them in. Hold up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thank you. Who's next? Oh. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Just to get back to the uh, the French drains. I live on Baja, Baja Loop, and I've got water all over my front yard. You hear that, Mr. Orfila? Yeah. yeah. I, I tested it with a chlorometer, and there's no chlorine coming out of the French drains. Excuse me, yeah? There's no chlorine in the water. So if it's irrigation water, wouldn't it be chlorine? No. Oh, uh, let me control. Water, when it comes out of the, uh, out of the city system, after it goes through, travels through the soils, it's going to filter just like actual spring water. There won't be any more chlorine. It goes 
through its just traveling for blocks and blocks and stagnant and the chlorine just dissipates. It's gone. And again, like I told you, you can go to any, any part of the new development. There is no water. Everything's dry. And, and what's the plan in this neighborhood? Because I know you could drive up and down the streets and on my way here, there's sidewalks covered in water. Yeah. And there's no way that particular house, their irrigation is no. flooding. Like I told you, it travels. Well, I understand it travels. Because you go back five or ten years to Google Earth, and you could see this whole neighborhood was put on a system of creeks. And yeah. where my house is, there's a creek that used to be underneath it. And my neighbors have the same issue, and the neighbors all the way down. And that's why if you look on Collado and Laja, there's always water there. And I built the French drain in my backyard because my backyard was always flooded to the front. I put a flow meter on it. I got 600 gallons a day flowing out of I my backyard. It. What are we going to do to fix that? We just thought a French drain, take it straight to one of the storm systems. That's the only solution. There is no other solution. And we're not going to stop the people from irrigating and keeping their green grass. How do we I've tried, but it ain't going to happen. How do we report these, these issues? Because I know I'm not the only one. You're not alone. Yeah. So I mean, no. again, uh, call my office, call three one one, requesting a French drain. Give me the address, and I will. That's my department. We do. Uh, again, I have a crew that that's what they do. Three hundred sixty-five days earlier. Are you see how that problem? Yeah. You know, I did. A, I did a trench before the, before the, side, the sidewalk and the grass, and that solved the issue of having the water on top of the sidewalk. Yeah. And you got rid of all the stains and the mold. So everybody was just to do a little trench, and then slide before the sidewalk and the grass, and let the water travel. You want to have Well, I've got a pipe going across the sidewalk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I can't You do need that. to go okay. down 24, 30 inches to get rid of the water. But specifically, La Halut, I actually just yeah. uh, learned about this. This is, uh, You're one of your neighbors, um, and I've already reported it, actually, to Mr. Afila uh, in the last couple of weeks. So. Um, I know that's on the list uh, of French trains um, coming up very soon. So um, there's definitely going to be some areas that are worse than others, and that one you're now the second person. And actually, I believe your neighbor might have referenced you because you yeah. built your own French train, which is well, uh, it's unfortunate uh, you needed to do that. They don't know where to go. Um, no, yeah, they don't know where to go. Yeah. So yeah. You're back to square one because your foundation, everything's still wet. You can go down maybe eight inches, twelve. That's the max you can go. Many people want to plant trees and grass that ain't going to grow either. It's too much water. The roots are off. And if you look at this this year, uh, you'll see how much we've done. I don't know if any of y'all have had it done in front of your home. But we've done a lot. And it's very, very expensive. And again, I really don't care about the money. I care about you guys. So um, just be patient. We'll, we won't get to y'all. Thank you. I have a question for you before you walk up. Uh, my question is specific to the data of the of the levels of the, of the fat of the soil. Were these fine, were this data known to the city prior yes. to the development? Yes. So it was known to the city, so it was foreseeable yes. that people were going to be irrigating them. So with that being said, wouldn't it have been, have been the best interest for the city to have established these branch trains? Because now with the city is now uh, contributing to the problem. Because now you have what you have going on, I'm not done. Because now what you have now, you have issues with the foundation and various problems over the area. They're creating a nuisance for people that are walking on the sidewalk and injuries. So it's an ongoing problem that the city contributed to that. So there's causation and it's linked to the issue. So with that being said, recommendation is being discussed and can able to the next um, you know city council meeting and bring it to into the table of allocating more funds to address all the issues that are going on here. Because before you know, you're gonna have a lawsuit in your in, in the city uh, city office for someone tripping or falling and, and breaking a bone. And or even at death because you know say the fall hit to the injury head. So these are just facts, and, and it's, it's, it's unfortunate that we're hearing this all of us as a community that the city was aware and the of the levels, and instead of addressing the issue, decided to collaborate and tolerate and allow and sign off on these developers. So the question now is going forward: all these new forest subdivisions are going to be implemented around our neighborhood. Now, based since this has been discussed. Is the city going to take this into account now? Moving forward, people are pushing out more developers. Or you see the body system. <laughs> I, took this to, I, I, I took this to I, I, I don't make the decision. The city council does. And I took. So they all say they, they just talk about. No, I'm not passing the ball to anybody. I'll, I'll, I grab the ball and uh, uh, run with it. Um, I took it to council, and I took on maybe about 12, 10 different developers. 
on them paying for the for the French drink. And I lost. This is what it is. So what I do, and now I'm installing the French drink. Right again, I can probably take care of all this whole subdivision that is here now. If we continue to grow, I can't keep up with the growth. So that again, uh, your council member has brought up. We have had the discussion, and we are going to take it back to council and hopefully get uh, the developers to come in and install a French drink, even if we have to give them some money for it. I don't care. As long as I don't have to come back and resurface again and throw the money twice. Because they can do it cheaper than we can. Exactly. That's the whole point. Yeah. So, and it's, uh, it's all about implementing the cost-benefit analysis. I've done it. I've tried so, that. Well, and I've been doing this for 26 years. You know, moving forward, I mean, it would be in the best interest that it's part of the planning zone before, before, before it gets authorized that this is taking into account because, again, litigation issues and just looking from a cost-benefit analysis, it's cheaper. In other words, we just got done and get it done. Before we do the I mean, the plans are done. Uh, there's engineering the, uh, PEs throughout the city. They come depending on on the PI, on the soil type, they add more base, more flex base material. And, but again, water just will destroy anything. I don't care if you put concrete, it will destroy it. Just like you see in Kill. And I want to add to her point about the potholes. Uh, you know, many many cities, because you know, water is a known fact, it's for super that it's in the rain, right, with, with our location. So with that being said, a lot of cities actually, do, you know, from cost benefit, this cost benefit analysis standpoint, in, bu in busy streets, they utilize semen. So, like, for example, there's a manual right here. Uh, somebody help me out with the name here. Washington. Uh, or even Kaskuskula. That's a main street. You have a, you have a pothole right here. Washington. Yeah, all of main streets. So why can we incorporate that? Because in the South, that's been implemented. In New York State, new uh, jurisdictions or whatever, by the way, that's So why can we do that here? It's, it saves the taxpayer money. It saves resources where you can allocate those resources that bring people on site to go address other issues. So it just, it's a win-win. Because as, just on those main areas, those main intersections, because that's where you have a lot of problems. And again, preventing litigation. That's all where it comes down to. We, we, all into litigation it. we will bring that up, and I do agree with you. And I'll follow up with an email just to, you know, just you to clarify and provide, yeah. uh, you know. We welcome feedback. Thank you. Just, just since you've asked a few, I just want to make sure I'm not missing anybody else before we... Okay, yeah, just... Mm -hmm. Microphone for her. Okay, thank you. Yes, hi. Um, I have another question. We have a ditch or a creek, I don't know what's it called, um, right here by a dead pole. And it's not paved or full with cement or anything. It's just dirt and it's not taken care of and we have the grass and trees and everything there and it's taller than our houses and i don't think it's fair that we have two hundred and fifty thousand dollar houses three three thousand dollars i think your house is probably houses, worth a lot more than that now and, and it's you know we have weed and trees there you know not not being taken care yeah. of so uh yeah. when these when these, mm -hmm. when these situations come up we have to uh confirm first off is it city hoa or other responsibility we've you, called hosa yeah. okay. we called the city we we and you know they tell us call hosa call the city you know nobody okay no, nobody's taking care of let's that. solve this right now nobody solve wants right to now. solve it and uh, I think it, it should be, you know, they should tell us, okay, it's Hosa, it's the city, it's... Can you give me the intersection one more time? It's uh, next, it's uh, by Day Paul, 101 Day Paul. I have it next to my house, and it's only not affecting me, but all my neighbors. I okay. can see them right here, but that's why I came. 101 Day Paul, I see it there on the south. Yes. West corner. Um, it's huge. And I'm pretty sure it's not only that one in particular. I, I'm pretty sure there's a whole bunch of them because I've drunk by, you know, and, and there's several. But that one in particular, you know, you can go, it's right here in the corner. The weeds are like huge. They're big, they're taller than my house. No, um, I will confirm with our HOA and with our okay. city uh, to verify. Here's my Thank you. cell. Okay, you can text me. Just Thank you. we'll keep it going. We will confirm who's responsible. 
If it's the city, we'll take care of it. If it's HOA, we will uh, we'll, you know, let them know it's their, it's their responsibility. So you have my cell. Yeah, OK. I Microphone for, OK. Mm -hmm. We called your office and the HOA and the city okay. um, to ask about the retention fund right down the street. Um, it's Canyon, Spanish Oak, Canyon Spanish Oak, Oak. Okay. Uh, all of these here. Same okay. thing, the weeds are tall. Um, snakes, rats, any vermin, okay. we've had them. Um, oh, yeah. They when used to come and cut the grass. I know the HOA used to, with the, they come with a tractor. Okay. Um, I know the city has been keeping the maintenance on the park, but no one's taken responsibility for that area. And the, the HOA- keep, The city's been keeping the maintenance for which park? Well, I saw them come cut the grass for oh. the park at Los Encinos. Okay. But I know technically that one's still HOA. Yeah, park, that's but, what I keep getting told. But as but, far as the retention yeah. pond, no one for has sure. taken account of it. Same thing. Um, I, and when, whenever you mention Spanish Oak, when she, I already screenshot it to remind myself. But um, also, just 100% confirm who's responsible. And the then, HOA says that that park is part of the city. So, which is it? Is it no, it's the no. HOAs or is it? Actually, I just spoke with the <laughs> HOA right before this. So I don't know who, but yeah. And that. You know, this goes back, you know, 10, 20 years when the city absorbed most of the pocket parks of San Isidro. Uh, that one in particular was not uh, agreed upon at the time. Um, Do you, you know, know if it ever will be? So, and that's something one of your neighbors and I have talked a lot about. Um, you know, he's mentioned it a lot. So, in general right now, Mike, to do something like that, we need five votes on the city council to make that happen. And in general right now, the city council uh, does not have the appetite to be adding pocket parks um, anymore like that we were doing for a while, because at this point, the city has 135 parks um, to maintain. And I know it's shredding uh, our park staff quite thin. And so in general right now, when there was another council member who tried to absorb another HOA park recently in a different district. Um, and the whole the council voted it down um, because of the concern that it would lead to a snowball effect where all the HOAs across the city want to give up their pocket parks and you know um, resolve themselves of responsibility because how how nice would it be just to say here city take care of it right from from an HOA standpoint so the concern is to try not to create this snowball effect where it starts this trend across the city where the city's now absorbing all the HOA parks that had previously been agreed would be the HOA's responsibility. So just, that's why I can't promise that that HOA park will be absorbed by the city anytime soon because, and I don't like to make promises that I can't keep. So, um, and I just don't, I don't believe right now, five council members would, especially just after that happened a few weeks ago, um, where it got voted down by the other council member. Um, so, that's the that that's the appetite right now of the council. So I just I have to be mindful of the temperature in the room, right? Um, and waiting for the right time to bring something like that up. Um, you know, we already have this park right here that we're in, and Spanish Oaks is obviously right down the road, right? Um, so in theory, it wouldn't be a massive burden on the. You know, it's not like we're asking them to come somewhere they're near, not that they're nearby coming to anyway. But it is extra resources, and we have to be cognizant of that, but um, in the cost, but uh, nonetheless, if, if the if the creek is ours, uh, you know, I, I think it, it might be the HOA, but I want to confirm, but my number, again, we'll be giving it out, we will follow up, uh, if it's the city's responsibility, we'll do it, if it's HOAs, then we'll, um, you know, we'll be talking to them, so. Can the city send a fine letter for not cutting, to the HOA yeah. for not cutting the grass? Is that yeah. Yeah, for sure. So uh, and then we have community. Good idea. <laughs> community development. Tina, just a quick question. You know, do we do we inf do we cite you know creeks? Uh, you know, creeks not being maintained by HOAs. Or the parks, like the grass. Or parks. In so, general, do we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So under the property maintenance uh, code, uh, we do cite HOAs. We mm -hmm. do talk to HOAs and make them responsible for their uh, maintenance of the creeks. Um, if it's a city property, uh, we, we handle it in-house, but um, anything property owned, owned by a property owner, we cite them, or oh, we warn them, we cite them, and HOAs too, but you can give me the property address and we'll look at it. I'm just talking about the parks, because you know, HOA finds us if 
Well, there's a weed, you know, here, cut the weed. So if these parks are hazardous, especially to kids and everybody around them, why can't the city to also send a fine, like, hey, you're letting this go? Yes, we, we do work with the HOAs, and we could also have a mechanism to enforce them. And you can also call those into 311 and we'll, we'll address them. <laughs> yeah, it's not just the eye source, the danger. It's just not the weeds, it's the danger that the whole thing, because we have rat infestations in our homes that we have to keep up with. It's not my home, it's the whole neighborhood. We have raccoons that because of the weeds and it's covered. So animals live there and our homes are, you know, because we have our trashes outside, the raccoons come in and, and feed out of the, of, of the, you know, the trash. So it, it, it's a lot of, you know, it's not only the weed, it's, it's a lot of other things that, that come, you right. know, that take. Yeah, I appreciate it's more than just uh, the eye, the eye sore. Yeah, and that's why we're not having. That it's mm -hmm. not beautiful to mm -hmm. the eye. It, it's a lot of yeah. other things going on. Yeah, and that's why I'm, I'm choosing to have these town halls to be, in, you know, introduce the things that are happening that I may not be aware of, so so we can um, fix it. So, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello, I, I got here late, so I don't know if this has been asked, but in relation to what was mentioned on the parks, is this the case also, I know you, you know, Los Encinos has these two parks, that one has always been an issue between the HOA and the city, but about, I don't know if anybody remembers, two, three years ago, the HOA mentioned that the land at the end of Juan Escudia had been donated for another park, yeah. because La Puesta, La Paz, Puerta del Sol, all these new subdivisions, we have no access to parks back there, we have to come all the way over here. Um, and of course, I think we all agree we want to get our kids away from electronics yeah. and outside more. Um, is that the case also on that? Yes. You know, you mentioned they weren't taking on any new mm -hmm. parts, but if that land yeah. is already donated, we'll yeah. So we have it, there. and it's a JJ, our parks director. We have a few. Ac it's a few acres there on Juan Escute, the southeast corner. The problem is, it is in a. Uh, there's a gas line, right? And there's a detention, it's a detention pond. So we can't build anything big and grand there, um, but we can do, uh, I don't know if we can do a playground, yeah. can, walking trails, playground. We soccer field. Too. Soccer That's field. So there are plans for something there. Uh, exactly. But can you explain the gas line sure. problem? Yeah. Um, so yeah. that, before I came on board, that, that land was accepted by the city and right in the middle, and I'm real familiar, I live right, I live right, around, right around that area. Uh, the, there's a gas eastman that runs right down the middle, smack of the two and a half acres of that land. So on the gas eastman, you cannot build anything down and 20 feet on the side. So we're kind of real limited to what we can build there. So, and talking to my park planner, we're just talking about that this morning, this, this afternoon actually. We are gonna build a walking trail, a soccer field, and on the southwest corner, we got a little room there that we could put some place, a little place game. All right. And I know, I know, it's there's a that's that prime land there. There's a lot of things we can do there. I wish, but unfortunately, because of the gas easement, we're real limited as far as we can do. So it's going to look something like the soccer field that you see right here. That will be that that can be built because if they have gas, if the company needs to come in. And fix it. They can just tear it up and we'll come back right back to it. We just gotta be real careful what we're gonna do. So, and then right, right next to it, across the street, you have the detention pond, and that connects a walking trail, right? That runs that runs south into Harmony Hills, and that's gonna be connected also into Harmony Hills. And speaking of Harmony Hills, that, like I mentioned earlier, that's we're talking 600 acre, 2,200 home. That's about to be um, a really big deal. Even though you might live in San Isidro. Uh, you know, you're going to be walking, dis uh, those of you especially in the Juan Escute area are going to be walking distance uh, and they're planning on doing a lot of things, not just homes, they're also planning on doing, you know, maybe some uh, other cool things. So it's not just going to be a community of homes because I know a lot of you out here feel like you, all, it's, just, it's just homes and that's it. And you need some connectivity, some other things. Um, and I'm mentioning connection also. So there are, there's big, uh, you know, that land, there's going to be a, a, a decent sized park 
um, that in, in that area, um, you know, that, that is a lot bigger than, you know, these little pocket parks. And it may not be in your backyard, but it's going to be in, it's going to be outside the loop. It's not going to be uh, you don't necessarily have to go to North Central for a big park experience. So um, that is coming, and I don't want to say too much, you know. But uh, you know, I just wanna, it, it's there. It's not like it's a secret that it's being built, right? Um, there are some really exciting things coming uh, to that area nearby you guys. So pushing yeah. back to the park over here, I just want to know if possible anytime to put some lights there. Lighting uh, by the Spanish Oaks Park? Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah, because there's all night kids are out there messing around. Uh, okay. Especially New Year's, fireworks in the trash cans, stuff like that. And okay. we found stuff there that shouldn't be there. Esmer, do you mind putting that down as a note, um, please? Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, I called um, your office and also okay. HOA. Okay. And it's the back and forth thing. Okay. They all ask me for pictures at night. Yeah. I mean, black. Okay. Yeah, we have to make sure that that's all you're seeing is black. Okay. Yeah, and the moon is out and it's real nice lighting. That's the only pretty good lighting we have in the moon. Okay. So, is there any way like for this part, if they could put like signs like for children at play? Because sometimes we have people that are screaming down the street and people just don't know. And there's people that are walking, jogging, crossing the street. These kids are walking around the street. Is there any way for this part? Sometimes don't know since there's yeah. cars parked on the street. People, the driver doesn't see the kids or the family crossing, and they're just like running past, or like there could be like a sign here for caution children at play or something. Yeah, Mr. Pena, do we have children at play signs for, from traffic, or is that something I have a special order? Traffic calming. Uh, I think a traffic calming solution might be the answer. That's common around parks and schools, so you we can, we can evaluate for traffic calming. We we don't use those uh, those signs. Anymore. So maybe you're saying more like speed bumps. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. As for yeah, speed bumps around this park in particular. Um, I think it should be in all parks, and there would be a lot of different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that was his point. Is that um, you know we do that in other other parks that's happened. So yeah, yeah, especially in Spanish Oak, I actually mm -hmm. a couple about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, yeah. I actually had a call the police because mm -hmm. there was a car racing and swerving yeah. in and out. And, and the good thing about that is even if the city doesn't uh, own the, the, the park, we can we can put a speed bump there. Yeah, so. That should be part of the city, yeah. like, parks plan for the city. Yeah. All parks. Yeah, in newer, park develop, park. newer developments, that's happening, the speed table additions, like, um, you know, um, that's something I think the city did eventually learn to be adding speed tables uh, in new developments. Um, so. It's unfortunately something the city learned later. Than, uh, but yeah, no, it's. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, good evening. Um, I was happy to hear that the town hall meeting was going to be held at this particular park uh, once because I live two blocks down the street. Yes. <laughs> so it takes me a quick stroll. Uh, with that in mind, I don't know if you noticed just from sitting here how close those vehicles are parked, like from across the street to each other. Um, the park is always in use, like every day, and mm -hmm. it really excites me to see all the teams come and go, like for practice in mm -hmm. the evenings. But it does get uh, quite packed up there, and then we have like the neighborhood cars and whatnot. The problem becomes that it becomes a single lane kind of street, and as you're trying to, as you're trying to uh, take a turn there, I'm forced a lot of the times to go into this side of the of the of the street, like going the wrong way, because right. there's also a big pothole there. So it's just like a few a few problems there, and just in different intersections. Uh, so I'm just wondering if there's any way. So basically what you're saying is um, this parking situation is not abnormal, you know, because me, I don't, I don't live right by, so for me I'm thinking this is a, a little event that's happening right now, it's, so the parking situation is saying, so you're saying this is a daily uh, yes. problem, yes. so, okay, yes. understood. Yeah, and, and you have understood. Like I said, you have a lot of yeah. parents, I guess, coaches, 
benches that are mm-hmm. on the sidewalk because okay. they don't want to be taking over the street. Right. But then pedestrians, strollers, or things like that, we, we have nowhere to go. We're trying to maneuver, and people are coming and going, especially after our work hours, after school hours. And it's just like you're trying to get at some point. Yeah, we can definitely have, um, you know, traffic and parks uh, take a look at, you know, I mean, I, I like to pretend I'm a traffic expert, Mr. <laughs> Pinion is, but, uh, but he's shown me many times I'm not, um, but, uh, you know, I, it's something I take seriously, and, you know, I, I don't, we can look at, you know, of course, any parking we add there takes away from the green space, right, but if, if safety um, um, deems it as a good idea, then, you know, whether it be, you know, I know we don't always love diagonal parking, but you know, <laughs> um, but yeah. looking at that as an option to not take away space from the actual um, street uh, yeah. space in that one way, you know, yeah. So, Ezra, I believe you're writing that down as well. Yeah. Like I said, it's safe to say yeah. that moving forward, we should mm-hmm. allow a parking parking lot for every park. Kind of yes, there should be a parking plan for moving every uh, for every park. I agree. Um, we're, we're experiencing that situation with Divine Mercy, of course. Um, depending on the uh, church for their parking and you know we're adding 140 parking spaces um, thanks to public works uh, south of those four all-purpose fields there which everyone is welcome to use by the way there's four new all-purpose fields um, by Divine Mercy Park um, currently a lot of the, the you know the leagues uh, you know the flag football leagues and stuff go there but they don't own that those four uh, fields right JJ said um, so that part, those four all-purpose fields is for everyone. Um, if you feel the leagues are um, try- dominating the area and not allowing it open for public, whenever you do go and try it out, let us know because it's not theirs, it's everybody's. Um, they're not you know, paying for that, so it's, it's, it's everybody. So that's a really nice new uh, thing that's happened. I know it's going inside the loop, but um, just so you know, there are those four new all-purpose fields. Uh, soccer, flag football, um, you know, and there's, we're actually still seeding it, uh, striping it, but it's currently being used um, nonetheless. Uh, that's just south of Divine Mercy Park uh, off of the new Springfield extension. So just so y'all are aware, that is another place to go. Maybe not be in your backyard, but it, they're, they're, it's a big, big set of fields, and parking is going to be available. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have a question on that um, light. I haven't seen any lights on the one that's right where uh, the Texas, you know the name? Mm-hmm. The, bir- the one behind the Berkeley field? The Berkeley field? Yeah. The Gassy field? Yeah. The Gassy field? Yeah. Uh, that's like, it's a field, anyone can go there. <coughs> we, we do need lights because if it's going to start getting really hot, it could just how you're going to have to practice later. And I haven't seen any lights. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, second, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. Can we, can we, I just want to make sure I'm. It's what? the one right. Well, I mean, there's no strikes and there's no hurt. Yeah. But we're talking about that was the other thing. The and all that. No, 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 no. It's, it's the one right here, right? Um, <laughs> right behind yeah. the yeah. smoothie king. Yeah, smoothie king. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the north part. Baseball, hockey. Because, like I said, there's a gas easement there. 
So we're gonna put two backstops on the northeast and on the northwest corner of that park. That way there's like a little baseball field that they can use as well. So that, that's that's the plan. And then on the on the other corner we're gonna do a little place game and a soccer field on the other corner. Yeah, because there's there's this like all purpose field, which is great, but also our kids need to know when they're practicing like an actual just baseball field. Right. So now on the other side, um, educational side, we need transfer library. Okay. Yeah. Even if it's small, I have to get, we have to go all the way to Mines Road, yeah. all the way over there, and I feel like yeah. these houses produce a lot of taxes, oh, yeah. taxes and taxes, and I see all, all the other areas have something new, yet our tax is not enough to build things like that. Oh yeah, no, this is and something I am s spending so much time on looking for so basically to without spilling all the beans my my number one goal for the district is a rec center with a branch library right and i've got about three locations that um you know could could make a lot of sense maybe even a fourth that's you know and the the key is finding the right land and the and potentially donor of the land when there's there's a few out there interested um and then finding the fun the unique funding mechanism to make it happen so so in the old days a, a rec center would cost six million maybe nine million in, uh, recently as we know with inflation that's doubled by now so we're talking 15 to 20 million for for a rec center so um doing it the old-fashioned way of going through the capital improvement plan um we're gonna have to get creative on how it gets paid for. And we have our economic development director here, um, Miriam, who she's been helping me uh, find, uh, this Miriam, by the way. <laughs> she might be here as a constituent, I don't know, but. Uh, <laughs> but no, but uh, I'm trying not to put anybody on the spot. I mean, I text that took a lot of heat uh, earlier, so I'm, I'm trying to own as much as I can here. Um, but she's been helping me find um, various options. There's these tax incentive reinvestment zones called TURSs, similar to what the, the coves at Winfield's doing. That's, it's a way to collect revenue to pay for bigger projects in a, in a specific region. There's ways to partner residential with warehouse space being developed and the new tax appraisement value increment that's coming from those new warehouse developments to get back into our community. Um, that that, that method does take a little more time, you know. Um, so, and then of course, anything that I'm proposing, you know, and that's why I'm trying to be extra nice to my fellow colleagues on council, um, because all this stuff requires five votes out of nine, right? Um, and um, building good relationships with them is what, down the road, you know, gets them uh, to vote for something that is exclusively going to benefit District 6, right? And, 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 I'm making this case all the time, um, so I promise you, uh, I am I am find, trying to find every possible way. It's going to happen. I'm just going to tell you that. Okay, I, I'm just. It's just a matter of how much more longer we have to wait for it. Um, but not that we're just sitting around waiting. There's just we're just looking at all the different ways. I want to do something similar to Faskin, which is where they have the, the rec center and the branch library in one place. Two birds with one stone. No, it's a thing. It's it's every little minute that you're in traffic, you're not spending it uh, quality time at home. I get it. Um, so yeah, I promise promise <laughs> this I'm not gonna let up until it happens, okay? Um, it's it's uh, it's gonna happen. I just I just can't say it's happening tomorrow, but it's 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 actually happening. We're making progress. Like com good conversations have really started to forming that. So yeah, I promise. Yeah. We have one more question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. King, first of all, thank you for putting this together. Uh, yeah. Really appreciate it. Uh, I first been here. We've been here a year and a half. So much that we do think you're doing a fantastic job. The second part of that is, are we taking minutes on this? Reason why I ask is because maybe the next time we meet, instead of everybody just bringing out all these issues, there's a bunch of action items that have been talked about. Mm -hmm. and instead of saying and, and us bringing out more and more and more yeah. stuff, we're not getting done. 
maybe the next meeting can be we discuss this and this is what we did okay yeah. and have and, some and, kind of solution to those action items for sure and and um and as we've been taking notes and this is being recorded as well of course okay. um but i agree let's have another one uh in a year you know and you know because of course we're going all over the district right um six months maybe okay <laughs> <laughs> well yeah yeah just uh, then you're gonna have everybody. Oh, why not? You know, but yeah, no, I hear you. Um, and we're gonna. This is ongoing conversation. Uh, but yes, we will come back. You know, we don't. We can choose a different area of this side of town. Um, but and I, I didn't even. You know, not that I'm in, in trying to pat myself on the back. But in the first six months, uh, after all the years that you, you guys were uh, dealing with the issue uh, along the Loop 20 with Havana, the, one of the first things I was able to get done with the help of TechStop. Uh, was that concrete barrier uh, from uh, from Havana, I'm sorry, from International and all the way to Eskimo. So, um, you know, that was something I was really proud of. Um, you know, it was June of my first uh, turn, uh, year in, and, um, you know, I, I made a big stink about it at a couple council meetings, and um, TechStop heard and, and finally did what we'd all been asking them to do, what everyone had been asking them to do for years. Um, so. Um, you know, I, I want, I'm saying that to say I care about you guys in the, uh, in the outside of the loop because I know y'all feel, um, like I said, disconnected from the rest of the city and um, kind of neglected. So. And also the playground, so that was yeah. really good thing about the playground because they added another yes, area. Exactly. Yes, no. yeah. parks. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yes, that one's yeah, there's a phase two coming, by the matter of fact. Yeah, I should. Yeah, and uh, all the credit to uh, the middle school kids who brought that uh, idea to Dr. Martinez, my predecessor, who then got a massive donation from a private individual uh, that was able to make that park happen in North Central, the ADA park for all for all children. Um, and then that was phase one, and we're trying to merge phases two and three um, into just phase two and just get it done. And. Um, we, we, we actually, you know, we've submitted it as a proposal for uh, potential earmark and federal congressional earmark coming up uh, this year. And it, it, it get paid for that way, finishing it. And then we have, I have a meeting with that same private donor tomorrow. Um, and if, if it gets funded federally, then that money that he's going to donate can go to something else, right? But otherwise, he's committed to donating again for the phase two of that park, um, which is going to be have dunes and sand and uh, a lot of cool stuff. Um, Finishing the rest of the salamander uh, theme that it is. So, yeah. Uh, Dr. King, I have two questions. Uh, the first question is what can be done about the airplane noise in this area? Uh, the reason why I'm asking is I understand there's airplanes flying by in the middle of the day. Yeah. But uh, unfortunately, there have been situations in which they're flying at 11 p.m., 12 a.m., 1 a.m. And they're flying really close to the house to the point that it literally shakes the foundation of the house. Um, I know we talked about this a while back and referred me to the director of the airport. Yes. Met with the director of the airport. And they brought up a really important uh, fact. Uh, they brought up the fact that the house that I live in, which is close by, doesn't uh, apply for the code that they had before for um, inc um, incredible amounts of noise, for, for noise pollution for the airplanes, right? Mm -hmm. They told me that code hasn't been updated since about 20 or 30 years ago. Um, I don't think that's appropriate because the city has uh, grown a whole lot since 30 years ago. Um, I just wanted to know if there's a plan, if there's something to limit the, the flight times or the routing because I asked uh, the director of the airport and he told me that this area is not considered uh, airplane um, area. Yeah, yeah and I, I know this is also airspace of course being governed by the Federal uh, Aviation Agency and you know so we, we this is an area we have to work with uh, you know, federal partners uh, on this and um, you know in a, in a federalist society you know he, uh, this, as a city, we can't pass an ordinance that supersedes uh, a state or federal a law, right, or regulation. So um, it's really about working with uh, our federal partners. But I, I will say before we before we uh, before we chat it before the 
things started today. You did at least mention it was getting a little better, perhaps. But um, it, it is getting but, better. Um, but sure. nonetheless, um, we, you know, it's an issue that, uh, and it's an issue that we can still be addressing better. Um, and uh, I know our L, uh, Gilbert, uh, was, our director, was able to work, uh, talk with you, and I know the answers he gave weren't uh, fully satisfying. Um, but and just as we're just make sure we're, can we get that added to the list, just to follow up to see. If there is anything the city can do. Yeah, I mean, my, my main yeah. concern is that that code hasn't been updated for many years. You're talking about the city code hasn't been updated? Yeah, okay. like literally, the city like the, mm -hmm. the, um, I guess the limitation, the delimitation okay. of the areas that are considered yeah. air pollution, yeah. like airplane pollution, and it, they haven't been updated in like 20 or 30 years. Okay. So what I bring up is I would suggest for that to be reviewed. Okay, let's, we can uh, definitely bring that back to council uh, and see if... You know, our legal department can help us um, see if we can update our ordinance to better reflect that. So, yeah. yeah. And thank you. Yeah. Second question is, uh, I think one of our biggest concerns so far uh, recently has been water, right? Mm -hmm. Water conservation. Um, this is what I've noticed, and I've always wondered, why is it that there's so many car washes around Laredo? And yeah. who approves them? And the second question to that is, is the water there being recycled, or are we actually losing yeah. water from so many car washes in the yeah, city? Yeah, luckily, yes. Those water, those car washes are um, they are recycling their water, so they have to they have to recycle to to be there. So, um, and yeah, I agree. Car washes in every corner, uh, kind of uh, you know. So, and I, I know I know people who are in the car wash business, and they're 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 starting to see that competition reflect. Uh, you know, not doing as as well because it's a saturated um, market. Um, so, you know, I know there's, uh, there hasn't been any new car washes approved in, in District 6 since I've been in, but I, I know, uh, you know, there's, there, there's that one on International McPherson, which is a pretty much a parking, uh, and, and traffic nightmare. Um, you know, I, you know, that was, uh, there's, there's issues that come up with them. Um, there's a lot of, you know, a lot, yeah, I, 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 it's, it's obviously businesses have seen it as profitable in the past, so they, and because there's low low maintenance and low staffing requirements, you know, it's kind of like the storage units, right? It's a similar thing. Yeah. Um, so that's a way that people found that to be profitable. Um, but I think moving forward, it's getting to be saturated. And so, is, is there a way to get data as far as how much water they're recycling? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if our utilities is yeah still here. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Arturo. Mr. Garcia. Um, I know you've educated me on this before about our car washes, so maybe you could do a better job than me. Good evening. Thank you very much for being here. Again, Arturo Garcia, Director of Utilities for the City. Uh, regarding these uh, new car washes, I know by code they're required to have water saving devices. So they use minimal amounts of water. Uh, as far as data, I can get information from each manufacturer of their equipment or their fixture units and have what consumption they have and how much they recycle. Uh, that information is not available to, to us as far as their operation, but I can get based on the what equipment they have identified. How does, how does that affect uh, the amount of water that we have uh, for our population? Because it is going to be a percentage, right, that's going to be assigned to the, to the car washes. How, how is that affecting our overall water? IBWC defense. Yeah, well, as far as the water rights, yes. The, the, the water rights are controlled by IBWC as far and TCEQ, Water Master. But their use or consumption, the highest amount of use is irrigation. That's, we need more efficient <coughs> irrigation systems. Are we going to be more aggressive promoting zero safety like San Antonio or yes. Yes. Than yes. That's, and, and I think, yeah, with the car washes, I think we might be losing the forest for the trees because we see them everywhere, but really the low hanging fruit, the big thing is our conservation with our irrigation. Yeah, I and, and I did, and, yeah, and I've been, um, and I, but we should probably wrap it up officially and then I can stay and chat with people. I know it's yeah. almost 830 and you know, our staff probably you know, need to go home to their families, but I'll, I'll stick around. But uh, we are updating the water conservation ordinance, um, which and will include rebates for zero scaping um, and also uh, for drip irrigation systems because um, we, we just got to be better about conserving. But I don't know. Yes, and we, we're trying to model it actually off San Antonio, to be fully honest. So, um, but anyway, I, let's say uh, because I respect everybody's time, our staff, a big round of applause to our park staff. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
you're thinking of, they think you're talking for me. It's for you guys. Okay, no. Anyway, thank you all for being here. Um, I know we lost some people, naturally. I uh, should have probably ended at 8, just to respect everybody's time. But I'm here. Um, get my card out, for those of you who haven't given it to. Um, I know there's a lot of things in the city that needs to be addressed. Um, and uh, working on it uh, day by day to make uh, improvements. So, yeah, thank you all for being here. And we'll, uh, I'm your council member. I'll give you my card, and I'm in touch. So, thank you.